I'm Liz Barrell from the City Planning Division. I have Carrie Fukui also from the City Planning Division and um, Roxanne and Jing in the back. And we um, are very happy that you've come this evening to, uh, to our presentation about sea level rise. So we are starting, as you can see here, by showing a little film about the melting of the ice cap. And um, wait till you get to 2007 here. Um, this is just background information about what, why it is that we're all struggling with the issue of sea level rise. Um, not the only reason, but part of the reason. And you'll hear more about it from our panel tonight. So we're working on a project called the Local Co Coastal Program Land Use Plan. And this is a document that the city is required to do as a coastal jurisdiction. Um, sorry, this is suddenly really loud. And the Coastal Act of 1976 mandates that all coastal jurisdictions prepare an LCP. The LCP is made up of two parts. There's a land use plan and an implementation plan. What we've been working on for the last two years is the land use plan. So this is the document that contains the policies. It's a little broader. The implementation plan is a document that follows with really specific requirements, like a co it's basically a coastal zoning ordinance. The city has a land use plan that was partially certified by the Coastal Commission in 1992. It hasn't been updated since, and there were a lot of what they call white holes or areas in which the commission declined to certify the uh, plan. So um, it's been a long time, and the project has been um, going on since 2016. We did outreach to the community. We went to talk to a lot of people. We did another uh, session on sea level rise a couple of years ago that was over at San Monica High School, if any of you were there. And, and then we got our draft document written, and it's been out since uh, the end of January. There were some small changes in February, and it's out for public review right now. We are going to have a study session next Wednesday, March 21st at the Planning Commission. And after that, um, we'll draft the final uh, LCP land use plan and we will be bringing it to the Planning Commission and the Council for adoption. So the LCP has um, background information. It has actually a really good and interesting information about what's in the coastal zone, what the sub areas are, um, of, of the coastal zone and what some of the um, activities that have happened since 1992 to um, improve the coastal zone in terms of um, the environment and access and all sorts of things like that. And then the policies. And tonight we're just going to be talking about the sea level rise policies. So this is kind of Can you move, can we move that down? No, I don't think it's, it's the projector. It's the projector, okay. All right, so why are we discussing sea level rise? As you saw from that little video clip, um, climate change is, is happening, and um, this, is, this is a fact that I think we are all accepting of and understand, and one of the things that the city has decided quite a long time ago is that we need to really care about our environment, we need to look at our environment, see what's going on, and plan for it. So um, the models that we have been learning about in the last couple of years show um, accelerated rates of sea level rise, and that's the accelerated rate of the um, ice cap melt, as you saw from 2007, and you know, we, can't, we can't ignore that. So we, there's a couple of things that we can do, and one of them is that we can change our behavior and we can um, plan for ways that we can um, capture stormwater so that we don't have as much pollution running off into the ocean. We can do green building um, so that we're, have, because buildings also are, are big emitters of GHGs, greenhouse gases. And so that's, and that's a part of this whole uh, project that the Office of Sustainability and the Environment with 
which, and I will introduce the panel in just a moment, but which they've been working on. And the other part of, the, of what we can do is that we can plan for resilience and we can plan for what um, we are going to require of development in the future. And that's the kind of thing that is in the local coastal program and our project here. And this, by the way, is a visual from the OWL, which we have a poster up over there. This is, in case you missed it, this is not there at the Santa Monica Pier. Um, but this is an idea that perhaps in the future could be. So um, tonight we have three um, kind of major areas that, that we're going to be learning about. And the first is the science behind sea, sea level rise and behind the models. And we're going to understand what's the policy approach that we're taking in our LCP land use plan. And then we're going to hear about current and future resilience efforts, um, what we're already experimenting with on our beach and what we could do in the future. And you're going to hear about that from our experts who we brought together today. So um, let me introduce Shannon Perry, who will be moderating today, uh, this evening. And she is from our Office of Sustainability and the Environment. And our three panelists, Juliette Finzi Hart, who is with the USGS, and um, Karina Johnson, who is with the Bay Foundation, and Melissa Ochter, who is with DUDEC. And DUDEC are the consultants that have been working with the city um, on the LCP. And in particular, um, uh, they have been um, instrumental in uh, providing these, uh, these sea level rise policies. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Shannon. And you can introduce further. Oh, well, thank you. Welcome. I appreciate everybody taking time out of your day to prioritize this very timely and relevant conversation about sea level rise in our uh, coastal community. So I'm going to start by telling you a little bit about each of our panelists. Um, I know that their um, extended bios were available and many of you have the handout. I wanted to let you know that the, their bios are on the first page or what is the back side of the cover page. So let me just give you a brief introduction so you know who you're, who you're hearing from today. I'll start with uh, Dr. Juliet Hart. Juliet is an oceanographer at the USGS's Pacific and Coastal Marine Science Center. And she serves as the Director of Outreach for Climate Impacts and Coastal Processes. Juliet was also with the USCC grant uh, program and has been involved in our sea level rise assessments uh, from the beginning. Um, our next uh, panelist will be Karina Johnson. Karina is the Director of Watershed Programs for the Bay Foundation. One of her current projects is implementing beach and dune restoration projects, which may work to improve coastal resilience against climate change impacts. And you'll get a chance to hear about that more specifically this evening. And then finally, we have Melissa Ochter. Melissa is an environmental scientist and coastal planner at DUDEC. She aids local governments in developing sea level rise and coastal hazard policies. So with that, let me tell you a little bit about our format and then we'll jump right in. Um, we're going to try not to give you one person, one PowerPoint, one person, one PowerPoint. Um, we're gonna try to ha host more of a discussion amongst the panelists. Um, so I'll start out by asking a couple of questions. Each of the panelists has some slides that are complementary to um, the information that they wanna share with you and then we'll go from there. We'll see where our conversation takes us. My first question will be for Juliet Hart. Juliet, I wanted to talk a little bit about the science behind the LCP. Let's just take a minute to make sure that if anybody uses an acronym that you are unfamiliar with, this is a safe space to raise your hand and we will make sure that we have a shared language um, and we all understand what we're talking about. Um, LCP in this scenario stands for Local Coastal Program. Um, so, Juliet, I wanted to talk a little bit about the LCP's proposed sea level rise policies um, as they provide the basis for the city's need to plan strategically and to look at regulations around our coastline. Um, I wonder if you could start by explaining the connections between climate change and sea level rise um, and give us an update on what we've already seen in coastal areas, specifically the California coast. No. Nope. 
She could probably use oh. her oh. and then push it. Hello? Off. Oh, when you talk, do you? Oh, there you go. You're push on. Oh, so you have to hold, touch it and. No, but push it off while you're touching it. Oh, wait, okay, okay. Yeah. No? That? Okay. Yes. So being a Fed, I'm very aware of hot mics, so <laughs> we turned them off earlier. Okay, so like the, um, the visualization that Liz showed, this is, I have a couple of visualizations that show the, the warming of the earth that I think are really powerful and kind of leave no doubt about what we're looking at. So these are, I'm gonna let, run this and maybe if, if we want, we can run it a couple of times. Oh no, hold on. Can you try pushing to see if it'll play, Carrie? Uh-oh. Uh, rats. Okay, well, that was a really cool visualization. <laughs> and <laughs> actually, if you go back to it, so what you end up seeing is this shows you the globe, you know, around the 1880s through 1884. And what it does is it basically shows the, the, the temperatures. And what it does is it takes all the recorded temperatures of, um, at the globe, and then they model it all together so you can see it. And eventually, when you get to 2015, as it gets warmer, this ends up being red. So it's a really dynamic and visually impactful way of seeing how the Earth is warming. Another way of showing it is this one, which is working, which you probably can't see as well. But what it's doing is the same kind of thing, and it's showing all of the different measurements of temperature from whenever this started, early 1900s, to today. And of course, you know, as you're going out further, you're looking at warmer and warmer increases in temperature. So it's just another way of showing what that other graph was showing, which is that we're very clearly, the Earth is getting warmer. I'll let it run to the end. So there's a lot of these really amazing graphics that are out there now that help show some of the science that may seem um, overwhelming and complex, but when you look at it like this, it really makes it simple and understandable. So the way that this relates to sea level rise is that there are lots of different ways that the, the, the sea is rising. So the biggest factors that re are the reason why we see ri the ocean rising along our coast have to do with the earth warming. So if the earth is warming, it's then warming the water. If you know water properties, if it's warm, it gets bigger. So it's a very simple thing of water that is warmer just takes up more space and then it comes up on the land. So that's about half of the reason for what we're seeing in terms of this, the rise of seas. The other half of it is the melting of land-based glaciers. So we have glaciers in the water and then we have glaciers on land. The, those that are melting on land and then coming into the ocean, those are what are contributing to the rising of seas. So a lot of times when back in the day people were talking about climate science and they would talk about melting glaciers, you'd have someone with a glass of water and they'd have the ice in the water and then they'd say, see, you know, when the ice melts, it's not overflowing and they're right. And that's because it's the ice that's in the water. But what we're concerned about is all the ice that's on land that's pink. So if you had that ice cube here and it went into your water, you would see the, the level rising. So those are the two big factors that lead to sea level rise. But there's a lot of factors that, of what happens right out here, you know, and what we see off of our coast. And that has to do with what the earth is doing um, underneath us, whether it's uplifting or subsiding. Um, things like what we do with our groundwater. If we're pulling a lot of groundwater out, the, the land's going down, so the, if the sea is rising, it's gonna be a relative thing. So if you can imagine, here's land and here's the water. If your land is going up just from tectonic activity and the sea is rising, it's gonna look a little bit less than if your land is subsiding, like in Louisiana or other parts of, you know, of California where land is subsiding further north. As the sea is rising, it looks a little, you make a little bit of a difference. You see more sea level rise. So what is happening at our local sites is also leading to what we see. So there's a very relative component to sea level rise. The biggest source of uncertainty, and this is why we have the ranges that we have, is what's gonna happen with the ice. So this graph over here shows you the different components of what's leading to sea level rise at the, the moment. So as we were talking about before, ocean warming is really contributing to most of what we're seeing in terms of the rising seas. But these other components, all these ice, sh ice sheets that are on land, have these uh, additional components. But what we are actively studying right now and what we really are trying to understand as best that we can is what's happening with the ice. So there are a lot of different things feeding back in the ice right now and we're trying to understand how that will happen and how fast it will go. So when we start talking about some of the projections later on, that's why. It's because we're trying to figure out what's going on with the ice. So the question isn't, is it rising 
It is. The question is more how fast. And those are the numbers that we're trying to get a handle on these days. This shows you just a history. I promise this is my only graph like this. Um, this shows you just kind of the rates of sea level rise since the early 1900s. And you see it sort of flat here. It's picking up. And then here towards, as we've been pump putting more greenhouse gases in and warming up the temperature, you see this rate really increasing. The other side to it is winds and how the oceans are handling it, right? And so what you're looking at this here is a, a graph that shows the entire Pacific Ocean. This is, here we are, and this is the other side of the ocean. The reds are telling you the difference in how high the sea is relative to normal. So if it's red, it means that it's raising a lot more above what it was relative to the blue side. So what this is showing you is that most of the sea level rise from this period that was being measured, and this is using satellites, was happening on this side of the Pacific. So we were, we've been relatively sheltered so far from sea level rise up until 2011. We weren't seeing the high rates of sea level rise that the other side of the ocean was seeing. This, I, like, basically Shannon's the only person that invites me to parties anymore because I depress <laughs> everybody. So this is what we have now. So now you understand the color scheme and so what you can see here is that it's actually flipped. And this has to do with the winds that we have along our coast. So basically, something as you know, simple or as local as winds will have a very important effect onto what kind of sea level rise rates we're seeing where we are. So now you're seeing in these last you know, four or five years, they're looking at these satellite imagery and where they're seeing most of the sea level rise is off of our coast. There was a, a report that was put out about six months ago, and this has been the basis now for the state of California for updating its sea level rise guidance that all the cities and counties and agencies are gonna be responding to. And this is a really great report. It's actually super user friendly and actually interesting to read, not even for just oceanographers, <laughs> but it gives a really good um, description about all of the science that goes into what we're seeing off of our beaches and what we're, we're here today to talk about planning for. Some of the big kind of takeaways is in the last century, we've seen, depending on where you are in California, where we are, it's about four to five inches of sea level rise, but up to eight inches of sea level rise in the last century. Um, the coasts are eroding. Some of the work that our team has done is projected what's gonna happen to our beaches, and we're projecting 31 to 67% of beaches being lost by 2100. That's obviously a really important impact for California, and then um, impacts to coastal aquifers. So there's a ton of information in this report, and I'm happy to dig into it deeper, but I don't wanna take up too much more time, and um, I think that's my last. Oh, then, so this was a kind of a depressing little thought exercise that I did, but you know, this last year was a rough year for a lot of places, and I, one of the things that we kept hearing in the news was unprecedented, unprecedented, unprecedented. So I did a Google search of you know news headlines, and you know, the, the top one is cut off, but like meteorologists didn't even know how to describe some of the stuff that we were seeing. So we have sort of the chronic stuff that's happening with sea level rise, but then there's this episodic events, Harvey, Irma, Murray, you know, the fires, the, the mudslides, Topanga, right, has just had some mudslides happen. So on top of this sort of chronic inexorable thing that's going on, we're having these pretty significant events that are occurring. So that's, is that enough about the side? <laughs> Thank you, Julia. <laughs> I'm now, sorry. Now, now, that we, now that we're all on the same page about where we are with science, I did want to take a minute to do two housekeeping things. One is that you, you all seem to be very self-embodied and calm Californians, but I did want to let you know that when the screen and the building shake, it is not an earthquake. You're in a parking lot. I have seen people get worried about that before, so I just wanted to warn you all before that inevitably happens during our time together. Um, I also wanted to let you know that Liz, is, Liz does have um, pens and paper. Um, because we do want this to be a conversation, there will be an opportunity at the end um, for, for you to ask questions. So either jot down, your, jot down your questions as they come to you, and then um, flag down Liz, and uh, she'll, she'll grab your question, and then we'll go from there at that point. Um, so Juliet, thank you. I really appreciate it. Um, you know, we're, t we're talking about these issues that are both chronic and unprecedented, and here we are in the city of Santa Monica, and we're looking at coastal planning within a framework of chronic and unprecedented. So, um, you know, Santa Monica is basing its LCP sea level rise policies on a blend of results from a couple of uh, sea level rise and coastal storm models. 
I was wondering if you could explain these studies to us. You could tell us a little bit about how they overlap, how they differ. Um, are there other cities and counties who are using these models or similar models? And specifically, I'm really interested, and I think our audience would be interested in knowing, um, as f specifically for Santa Monica, what did the results indicate in terms of rising sea levels, beach erosion, and storm surge implications? Um, and if that isn't enough, I wanna ask you one more question. Um, given that the science is so complex and it's hard for non-scientists to um, grapple with some of these projections, I wondered if you found any successful tools or way to talk with people about this information. In fact, I have. <laughs> so let me see. You're going to see the little cheat slides for question number two. So, um, so one of the things that when we were first talking with Santa Monica, um, this was back at my Sea Grant days, but working, we've been working closely with Santa Monica for a really long time on lots of issues. Um, one of the things that we wanted to, we all kind of collectively came to the understanding was that it's not just about sea level rise, it's also about storms. So this graphic here is a really nice graphic that was developed for San Diego that is a very simplified version of all of this, all the components that go into what we're thinking about. So if you imagine you have your house on the beach, this is apparently on the east coast of the US, but um, <laughs> let's pretend, we'll flip it. You're, uh, you, this is your house on the beach, this is today, this is where the sea is today, so you can walk out your 300 feet and this is where you see the water. And then you go out on a, on a big um, storm event day or on a day where there's um, uh, really, really high tide and you see the water further up the beach. So then as a city is starting to think about, okay, the future's coming, there's gonna be sea level rise, there's gonna be climate change, I need to be thinking about sea level rise. So let's imagine that this is a scenario for mid-century, say 2060 or something like that. If you were only thinking about sea level rise, you might think that you're pretty safe. The problem is you're gonna have this heightened water level on the beach and then on top of that you're gonna have these potentially unprecedented events or just your run of the mill high tides that are all gonna add up and eventually come and start to impact onto development that's along the coast. So this is one of the reasons why there's so much science in the work that's been done that we're talking about tonight. What we've done is, um, I'll come back to that one in a second. Um, so there's, I didn't wanna put any graphs about the modeling up because I wanted to just talk about it because it's just, I don't wanna bore you guys with too many PowerPoints. But there's basically two different models that went into what is feeding the, the science behind the decisions that are in this LCP. There's the, the group that I'm with at USGS has developed a model that looks at coastal storms. So we look at what happens when you have sea level rise and these storms and how they relate and then how that translates onto shore. There's another group called ESA that has done some modeling that looks at um, similar type of flooding, but they take a, a different approach. And so USGS, our approach is more of what we call the, the term in science is deterministic. So it's meant to give you sort of the likely projection of if we put all the different components into the model, we use global climate models, then we, make, we take the wind and the pressure, and then we make waves, and then we run the waves up onto the shore. Our model gives you sort of if you put all those statistics together, what we think is the most likely outcome. We don't know what the most likely outcome is. None of us can predict the future. We just try to model it as best as we can. The other model is really good at giving you, if everything hits at once and really hits you, you know, what is the worst case scenario? So for a city to be thinking about, we need to be thinking way into the future. We may not know when these impacts will hit, we need to know the bounds of sort of what we need to be planning for. So the benefit of having both of these models here was to be able to get a really good sense of the full suite of vulnerability that the city of Santa Monica faces. And the, the, both Cosmos, Cosmos is available basically from point conception to the border and then the Bay Area and outer Bay Area and we're now doing Central Coast. So it's basically statewide. We're hitting the last two counties in 2020. But, um, and then the ESA modeling has been done in lots of different places. And so I th believe the city of LA, I don't know, I think one of them was gonna be here tonight, but she's not here yet. They're doing a similar type approach where they're combining both of the modeling results. I think they're working. Venice. Yeah, yeah, Venice. So, um, and then in Santa Barbara and all these different places, wherever this information has been available, that's been sort of the model is to use whatever is there. Because there's a quote that, you know, all models are wrong but some are useful, and that's really important because we're doing our best with the modeling, but ultimately they are a tool to guide the discussion, which ultimately rests in what this room wants to do with the future. So I can show you some of the results um, 
from the Cosmos modeling. And when I talk about, that's my team's modeling. It's called the Coastal Storm Modeling System Cosmos. And when I talk about coastal storms, I'm talking about wave events off the coast. And I want to just put into perspective what I'm talking about. I don't know if you remember this image. This is from 2015 in Ventura. So that's the pier in Ventura. The flag is at the end of the pier, right? And so this was a really, really big wave. This, <laughs> when, it, when we looked at the tide gauge, and it's like an understatement, right? When we looked at the tide gauge record for this, this was about what would be called like a, I think it was like a 12 year event. So it, this something like this could happen once every 12 years is sort of the statistics behind it. So 10-ish year event. I'm gonna be talking about 100 year events. So when you see the flooding from the 100 year event, think about this, but bigger, right? So I just want you to have some kind of scale for what I'm talking about. So here we are. Um, we are, where are we? Oops, we are here-ish, right? Somewhere around here? Where are we? We are here. There we are. Eek, my stick, there. Yeah, right, right, right there. So we're, right, there's Rand. Right here, right? Yeah, right there. Okay, so we're safe. Um, and we will be for the duration of these projections. But this is showing you just today. This is showing you with what is currently projected for the, 20, for the end of the century, around 2100, which is 66 inches, about two meters of sea level rise. So what you see with Santa Monica is that because we have these wide sandy beaches, that is our first line of defense. They really help protect us from sea level rise, basically, because there's a whole bunch of sand in between us and the sea. When you put the 100 year, remember the 100 year storm is a massive whopper of a storm. When you put that on top of this, you start to see some of your vulnerability expand. So this is why with the modeling that we do, and then there is some of the computations in the other modeling that's also in here that we also try to model, that they also try to model this type of storm. This gives you the, the, the sense of what you're thinking about if um, you're trying to plan for the future. The other information that we're able to look at is where is the coastline going to be? So here, it's very faint, unfortunately, but this little yellow line or peach line here shows you where the shoreline is today, and this is where we project it to be by the end of century. So all of this information is now put into the maps that are in the report that you can look at. I think you probably get the GIS layers. I don't know if you, well, I don't know if the GIS layers are available for the community, but anyway, the information is there, and so you're able to look at, you know, parcel by parcel, basically what you want to, what the vulnerabilities are for the future. But, you know, this kind of stuff <laughs> is, um, you know, y'all are very quiet, right? And so it doesn't necessarily move you to be ready to take action. And so one of the things that we were able to do with the City of Santa Monica and USCC grant was try to figure out some different ways of communicating this. And so did anybody make it out to the pier to see the owl? Okay. Not that many. Okay. <laughs> it's not an acronym, I'll tell you that. So see this thing here, because <laughs> everybody thought it was an acronym. This is, um, you know when you go to the uh, tourist attraction and you go and you look at a, actually they have them on the pier, like right up the way from there, but you can go and you can put your quarter in and see. So the trick with this was that instead of having it look out into the real world, what we had was a tablet in there. And what we were showing behind when you looked into it was you would actually see Santa Monica today, a, a picture of Santa Monica today. And you could look at it and go around the room like or go you know, 180 degrees and see the beach. One of the things that we really wanted to highlight was if you see back here, right up against the road, we wanted to show the, the original 1920s shoreline of Santa Monica. You know, people who have lived here probably know that these beaches that we have are not you know, naturally wide beaches, that they've been engineered to be these wide beaches from a lot of the Marina del Rey um, work back in the 60s. So they've made these wide sandy beaches, and so we wanted to give the history of what the beach was like. Then we showed some simulations of what this would look like with that whopper of the 100-year storm. So here's that same beach with this big 100-year storm. And as Liz started, you know, to not leave you on the edge of despair, we wanted to show you some of the potential adaptation strategies that you could do to mitigate against it. <coughs> so, you know, the difference between looking at something like this 
and so looking at something like this. So we, we did some social science behind it to see how that moved people, and what we found was it moves the people that came into it. The people that came in caring stayed caring. The people that came in not caring stayed not caring. But that middle people, the people that were kind of like, meh, eh, whatever, sea level rise, they were the ones that, were, that came out of it like, oh, okay, this, this means something to me now. So that's one of the ways that we were playing around with communicating this information and getting it to be understandable and something that people want to respond to. Great, thank you, Juliet. Yeah. Uh, I, I would guess that this means something to a lot of people in the room since you've chosen to spend your Thursday night here. Um, I did want to just get a sense of the audience. How many people uh, are Santa Monica residents? Okay. How about Santa Monica uh, businesses? Okay, great. How many people uh, went to the Venice sea level rise discussion earlier in the week? This is a, okay, great. <laughs> um, this is a conversation that's happening all around, uh, all around our community and obviously this, this is a subset of people who, who do care about this. So I thought I would turn our attention to Melissa. Melissa, we've heard a little bit now um, on the background and what scientists are forecasting in regard to sea level rise here in Santa Monica. So I wanted to turn to the connection with Juliet's work uh, with our city's current efforts to develop policies in the land use plan. Can you explain to us what the city of Santa Monica is required to do um, to address sea level rise in, in this document and who is requiring these policies and what are the guidelines that you were working with it? Yeah, thank you. The city of Santa Monica has received two grants from the California Coastal Commission to address and prepare for sea level rise, one in 2015 and one in 2016. Along with meeting these grant requirements, the city must also comply with Chapter 3 of the California Coastal Act, as well as the California Coastal Commission's sea level rise guidance document. CCC is California Coastal Commission. Thank you. <laughs> um, and if you see I just want to commend our first participant to ask what an acronym <laughs> may. Thank you. If you see SLR in any of these slides, that stands for sea level rise. Um, and CDP stands for Coastal Development Permit. What's NRC? <laughs> uh, I will explain that. That is um, one of the signs that we use. <laughs> um, so let me now show you what, what, how the California Coastal Commission sea level rise guidance came into policy, what it recommends, and what sea level rise analysis they recommend. So just to have some statewide background, in California we've had several executive orders related to analyzing and planning for sea level rise. Um, the Natural Resources Agency addresses sea level rise in their Climate Action Plan Safeguarding California, and Ocean Protection Council has their own sea level rise guidance, which is statewide guidance. And as Juliet mentioned, that was just updated and adopted last night. Um, so that's the newest sea level rise science and guidance currently. And I will discuss that in a couple slides. So the California Coastal Commission um, felt that it was important for them to have their own specific sea level rise guidance on addressing um, these issues within the context of the California Coastal Act. So they adopted their sea level rise guidance policy in August of 2015. The basic structure of the document is laid out here. Uh, it focuses on planning for sea level rise within permit applications and LCPs. It also contains guiding principles, discussions on sea level rise science and projections, impacts of sea level rise, the legal context, and some future adaptation responses. So it contains 20 guiding principles that frame the ideal approach for sea level rise planning, um, and they fall into four categories that you can see on this slide. Of these 20 guiding principles, the California Coastal Commission specifically highlights the importance of using best available science, using a scenario-based planning and precautionary approach while examining ranges of sea level rise, the importance of protecting the public trust as the sea levels rise, and coordinating regionally and maximizing public participation. So the, in the sea level rise policy guidance, it identifies the National Research Council, which is NRC, as their 2012 um, sea level rise for the coast of California, Oregon, and Washington as their best available science. The guidance explains how to use these projections that you can see on the screen, which is what the report shows us, um, and how to evaluate for both the physical impacts of sea level rise, such as erosion, wave runup, and storms, and all those other factors Juliet explained, and then how those physical impacts 
um, create impacts to our coastal resources. As I mentioned earlier, Ocean Protection Council did update their best available science last night. Um, so that is currently the state's most uh, updated sea level rise science and guidance. While those scenarios are different than what the Coastal Commission shows as their current best available science, both of the guidance have very similar main points across both. Use best available science, take a precautionary approach when considering sea level rise projections, and understanding the difference between analyzing high sea level rise projections but planning for moderate sea level rise and planning for futures through adaptation strategies. The California Coastal Commission is considering updating their guidance um, to address OPC's new science, but we don't know when that will happen. So if you do have any further questions about that, um, I can give you contact information for Kelsey Ducklow at the California Coastal Commission. And she gave us a couple of these slides that the Coastal Commission wanted you to um, see as well. So um, what the California Coastal Commission sea level rise guidance also explains is the planning cycle of planning for sea level rise. Um, and it lays out adaptation planning steps that many of you may have seen, but what the Coastal Commission does is it guides it in the framework of the California Coastal Act. And in doing so, it has these Coastal Act issues and resources as the main focus. So in steps one through three, you can see a layout of a typical vulnerability assessment, but the guidance highlights Coastal Act considerations that should be kept in mind while doing your vulnerability assessment such as planning horizons, hazard types like flooding, erosion, wave runup, storms, saltwater intrusion, and then examine how those uh, impacts impact our Coastal Act resources. And some of those are public access, recreation, sensitive habitats, marine resources, and scenic and visual qualities. So the sea level rise study that Juliet explained, the two different studies fall in steps one through three, and then steps four through six are adaptation planning within the context of the Coastal Act. And what that means is you incorporate adaptation strategies so that you're more flexible while you're adapting for sea level rise. Um, as you can see on the slide, we're currently on step five of this process. So we're drafting and updating LCP policies and will um, eventually go for certification with the Coastal Commission. So in conclusion, the city of Santa Monica must meet the requirements of the California Coastal Commission's grants and conform with the California Coastal Commission sea level rise guidance. Thank you, that's really helpful for us to understand the policy framework. I was wondering if we could move a little bit um, further down to the local level. I'm particularly interested, I think we're all interested in how the Coastal Commission's guidelines have been applied in the context of Santa Monica's land use plan. And particularly, I'm interested to know, how do the city's proposed policies ad address our anticipated sea level rise locally? And what kind of adaptive management policies is the, has the city incorporated into this document? There are three ways that the city's draft policies have addressed sea level rise. The first is that the draft policies comply with Chapter 3 of the California Coastal Act's hazard policies. The second is that they use a trigger-based policy approach, and the third is that the, L the draft LUP incorporates these adap adaptive management programs that I'll discuss. So um, the new draft policies address sea level rise by complying with the California Coastal Act, and specifically the Chapter 3 Coastal Hazard Policies. The draft policies directly incorporate a few California Coastal Act uh, policies, and there's two in particular that the Coastal Commission finds very important. Um, they form the basis of the California Coastal Commission's consideration on sea level rise, and this is section 30235 and section 30253. So section 30235 addresses shoreline protective devices, which are things such as revetments, breakwaters, groins, harbor channels, seawalls, and cliff retaining walls. This policy gives the authority to approve shoreline structures in certain circumstances to protect existing development coastal dependent uses, or public beaches, provided that the impacts to shoreline and sand supply and other coastal resources are avoided or mitigated. And section 30253 of the Coastal Act addresses new development, and it says that new development shall minimize the risks to life and property, assure stability and structural integrity, and neither create nor contribute to erosion, and will not require a shoreline protective device that will substantially alter natural landforms. So according to the California Coastal Commission, these two policies, when taken together, form the backbone of how they address sea level rise and development. 
So the next way that um, these draft policies address sea level rise is this trigger-based approach. So as Julia explained, the city of Santa Monica identified the sea level rise scenario. So we have near-term, mid-term, long-term, and long-term extreme. And um, we have trigger-based policies, which mean that we use these sea level rise thresholds uh, to um, reference when these policies will be triggered. So policies 3 through 29 apply immediately upon adoption, and they will, um, they will be apply through all phases. So they won't stop after you reach the midterm. They will continue throughout. These policies 3 through 29 include things like new coastal hazard maps, and these are all in your flyers, by the way. So they have new coastal hazard maps, the anticipated lifespan of development, real estate disclosures, technical hazards analysis requirements for coastal development permits, conditions of approval, and policies related to shoreline development, non-conforming structures, bluff face development, public access, and shoreline protective devices. It also includes a handful of adaptive management programs, which I will discuss in detail in a little bit. So once we hit 12.1 inches of sea level rise, we're at the midterm scenario, and policies 30 and 31 will come into account. In this time frame, some of our beachfront development has probably begun to experience some continuous damages. So the shoreline development policies take these damages into account. And in this threshold, the city will consider things such as creating a development impact fee program to fund activities and programs that address sea level, sea level rise along uh, Santa Monica's coastline. And then we get to the long term where we're at 24.1 inches of sea level rise. When we reach this phase, there will be much beachfront development and infrastructure that's impacted. The policies in this section aim to prioritize public access in the face of long term sea level rise. And lastly, we have some adaptive management policies. Adaptive management is a way for the city to remain flexible and cope with uncertainties while making the necessary management decisions on sea level rise. It provides a framework for the city to manage risks and take actions based on specific triggers and monitoring sea level rise and its effects. But it also provides the city with flexibility to um, choose from an array of adaptation options over time as they're monitoring these specific triggers. So there's three adaptive management programs in the draft LUP. The first one is a shoreline management plan for specific high priority beach sub areas. And this addresses sea level rise and coastal hazards and how they will adapt to changes in wave and flooding and erosion hazards in both the short and the long term. The management plan will prioritize soft adaptation strategies, which are things such as managed retreat, beach nourishment, and living shorelines and dune restoration over things like hard adaptation strategies like seawalls or groins. The second program is a beach nourishment program, and this aims to utilize beneficial reuse and placement of sediments that are removed from other projects, such as dredging projects, upland development, erosion control, or flood control facilities. The third program is a uh, mechanism for shoreline protection and management, and this is going to explore the feasibility of some incentive programs. Um, and they may include things such as the formation of a coastal geologic hazard abatement district, tax incentives, grant programs, or direct cost share assistant programs for private landowners to incentivize those soft shoreline structures, such as the creation of new dune habitats, uh, transfer of development rights programs, and some rolling easement programs could potentially be used. So in conclusion, the city is addressing sea level rise through complying with those chapter three coastal hazard policies in the California Coastal Act, uh, using trigger-based policies to approach and address sea level rise, and by incorporating adaptive management programs in their policies. Thank you, Melissa. That was very informative and really gives us a good uh, understanding of the requirements and the framework within, within which the land use plan was developed. I wanted to turn our attention now to um, Karina and bring your expertise in here. Um, Melissa spoke briefly about some of the adaptive management strategies um, and particularly uh, a little bit about beach dune restoration. And I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about that. I know that your organization, the Bay Foundation, has already provided us with a pilot beach restoration dune project on the North Beach. Can you tell us about that project? And particularly, I'm interested to know whether you've seen any meaningful results in the past year since that project was implemented. 
Absolutely. Thanks, Shannon. Can you guys hear me? Is my thing on? I uh, apologize. I have a, I'm getting over a cold, so I'm, I'll try not to cough all over everybody. But, <laughs> oh, or you too. I'm sorry. <laughs> so uh, Juliet walked us through some of the science behind climate change and sea level rise, some of the models and planning that goes into the development of this information. Melissa walked us through how that ties to the city of Santa Monica's uh, policies, regulations, the Coastal Commission, and I want to talk today about one particular adaptive management strategy. Um, I am a biologist, but today I kind of just wanted to show you some pretty pictures. Um, so mm -hmm. I hope that you'll this will be a little bit of a, a break from some of the data and move us from the understanding of these issues, the policy that needs to feed into this from a regulatory perspective, and into a solution-based conversation where we can talk about uh, what we could actually do about it. Uh, so the Bay Foundation, in partnership with the city of Santa Monica, um, implemented in December 2016 the Santa Monica Beach Restoration Pilot Project. Um, long name, small project, big impact. So. <laughs> Um, what we were looking for in particular is responding to three different goals. Um, one goal was really to enhance the beach, um, the natural ecosystem that would be here. Most people that live in the area don't necessarily know that beaches um, in have uh, native plants that live on them, they have a lot of wildlife associated with them, invertebrates, birds that support. Um, so one of our goals of this project was to enhance natural resource values. Another benefit was to try to provide a different form of recreation and education to beachgoers, um, people that might like to bird watch, or um, students taking educational tours, people that like to interact with nature, um, to give people a different kind of recreation in a small area on the beach. Um, and then the third is really kind of why I'm here today. The third goal was tied to evaluating this project as a potential to help buffer from some of these climate change impacts like sea level rise and wave erosion from these large storm events. So can projects like the Santa Monica Beach Restoration Pilot Project, um, which is really a beach restoration that will provide small scale dunes um, could that project protect some of our infrastructure, infrastructure, some of our homes from things like sea level rise and wave erosion? Um, so the, how many of you have been on the bike path in the last year just north of the Annenberg Community Beach House? Okay, how many of you have seen a low-lying three-foot sand fence along there? Okay, good. And how many of you have walked up and looked inside? Okay, good, good. Um, I'm glad to see a lot of you have. If you've gone out there in the last month or so, the plants have really started to take off and these rains are gonna bring even more. Um, but it's, a, it's an approximately three acre area. About two acres of that is fenced and then the surrounding, uh, the oceanward side of the project and the kind of surrounding buffer edge makes up the third acre. Um, the installation of the project is very simple. We put in a small low-lying three-foot sand fence and then seeded the whole area with native vegetation seeds. Um, it has volunteer community maintenance and a pretty rigorous scientific monitoring component, in part because we want to see the wildlife response, we want to see how people are responding to it, and we want to have this conversation about if this project is um, providing any form of protection from sea level rise. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about the results um, through pictures of the last year based on our scientific monitoring. Uh, this is an, uh, just an artistic rendering of where the location is in case you aren't familiar with it, just north of the Annenberg Community Beach House. Um, this is a uh, photograph that was taken of the project area prior and I will show you an artistic rendering of a few years in but the next few slides you'll see are just pictures from the last couple of months out on site now. 
Um, so this is what the site looks like today. Uh, you'll see the low-lying sand fence, an interpretive pathway uh, with symbolic fencing down the middle, and then an open front end that allows people to interact with the site. It allows open access um, from the oceanward side and maintains a um, driving path for lifeguard vehicles, emergency access vehicles. Um, and a buffer um, kind of in front of the project site. But you see a lot of different species. The one on the, the one on your left here is a red sand verbena. verbena. It has really beautiful purple and red flowers. Um, this is a beach evening primrose, a Camasoniopsis species. Um, so you'll see right now there's lots of little dots of plants, but what we're starting to see is the formation of some of these small plant hummocks that are the very beginning of dunes. And what these plants are um, specifically targeted for, um, they have kind of sticky leaves where sand that blows in from offshore or blows down from the ocean hits the leaves, falls, and kind of lands there. And the plants build on the small dunes as they form slowly over time. So we're about one year in, and we've got kind of tiny micro dunes that are um, between a couple inches and about a half a foot um, in height. But slowly over the next three to five years, they should form one to three foot small sand dunes. And what we've found is that um, this could potentially help buffer from some of that erosion that we were talking about and when some of the models show. Um, these are another just to show you some of the different species. Um, the photographs on top are that beach evening primrose I mentioned. These are all pictures from the site in the last month or two. Um, the bottom is this beach salt bush. We also have two species of sand ver verbena um, and a beach burr sage. And these were all chosen because they're native species. They're drought tolerant. Um, they can withstand um, uh, kind of wave action, salt water, sand and wind scour, um, and also for their potential to form these plant mounds that could form small dunes. Um, in addition, one of the things that we're tracking is how the dunes are forming over time. Uh, this is a shot from ap last April, and then this is a shot from last week. Um, and so we can see the vegetation starting to build up and these dunes especially forming along the fence line, um, which was intentional, um, but also the kind of small pockets of dunes on the inside of the site. And one of the things that we've seen <laughs> is that um, the uh, kind of elevation and topographic surveys that we've done have shown that last year especially when we had more rains, um, the site had less erosion than the control sites that we measured next to it and more of these sand dune formations. Um, so what we saw was less erosion during the winter and a retention of more of the sand on site than in the control areas that are just groomed and kind of flattened your, your classic kind of beach look. Um, these are some of those kind of micro dunes. You can see it's the really fine grain sand that gets trapped next to the plants. And then the coarse grain sand creates this kind of um, natural cobble pavement area um, that also serves to retain sand on site. One of the other benefits I just want to mention um, was something we had hoped for but not necessarily expected um, was the western snowy plover um, which previously had not really used this area but it was in the u.s fish and wildlife service um, um, protected plover habitat area um, we ha saw first we saw wintering snowy plovers and this is a th federally threatened species um, and then in april last april uh, the very first nest of a western snowy plover in LA or Orange County in almost 70 years was found on this restoration site. Uh, so it was unfortunately lost to high, really high winds at the end of April. Um, and we've been talking with US Fish and Wildlife Service about possible adaptive management strate strategies to save it if it happens again this year. But it just goes to show you that this, even just returning one small piece of the beach to a natural habitat could have some of these benefits for um, 
people like sea level rise protection, but also for wildlife like nesting for a federally threatened species. That's also just really adorable. <laughs> um, and then the last two slides are, are uh, artistic renderings that were done by Mia Lehrer and Associates. And it's, it's kind of a vision for what this site might look like in three to five years. Um, so you see the, those tiny plant hummocks will become larger plant hummocks. And uh, our, our partnership with the city is for the long term. We, uh, we pull, um, do community maintenance and kind of hand pick up trash. Um, the Coastal Commission asked us to reevaluate the project in about five years and see if maybe we could pull the fences to see if it would stay as a dune. Um, so these are all kind of future possibilities. And then this is my last slide. Um, it's kind of the vision from uh, the ocean side although the fence doesn't go quite that far. I'll stop on that one, that's good. Thank you, I really appreciate hearing about that, Karina. Uh, you said that it has a long name, a small, long name, small project, <laughs> big impact. I think you've absolutely demonstrated that. You mentioned that the project has benefits to both people and plants and animals, and I think we could we could all agree that the snowy plover returning is a demonstrated benefit to plants and animals. Um, I was wondering if you've heard any feedback from beachgoers or other members of the public and how they feel about this project. Yeah, well, I, I'm interested to hear, um, you know, possibly from some of you who have visited the site. We've had a lot of interaction with folks um, kind of on the ground as we're doing monitoring or community maintenance. And uh, we've had a lot of really positive feedback. We started this project with about a year of planning and outreach that we did in conjunction with the city of Santa Monica, including a couple of public meetings, um, a flyer, newsletters, media articles, a website, um, a mailer. I might have already said that. My brain's a little fuzzy from the cold. Um, but the... Um, one of the things that I think was strong about this project is all of that public outreach prior to putting in the actual fence gave us some time to get some feedback from the public. Um, and we, we took that and interpreted it and, and kind of applied it to the project itself. Things like making sure that the height of the fence in, from four feet was instead three feet so that people could have a better line of sight to the ocean and um, um, children playing and things like that. Um, one of the things was putting the interpretive pathway down the middle, um, making curved fence lines, having the front of the site be open so that people could interact with it uh, more meaningfully. Um, and then one comment um, from a member of the public will still stay in my head as, as a, uh, has just forever stuck in my head. Um, uh, the, this, this particular local resident um, we was kind of skeptical about the project and we got kind of halfway through showing some of the photographs of some of the flowers and the plants that would be put on site and uh, then they turned to the city of Santa Monica folks and said, okay, make it bigger, make it bigger, make it a ribbon of nature all the way up and down the coast. And I remember that as a ribbon of nature because it could also be um, tied to the visualizations that Juliet mentioned, some of these policies, adaptive management strategies. And so we could have this crosswalk um, of the potential for this project. At, at a three acre site, it's probably not gonna provide um, direct um, protection to you know, the beach club. Um, but if we expand it and apply this, these lessons learned in a larger way, um, we could have this actual uh, larger scale protection that we're trying to reach. Um, so we've, we've had generally very positive responses, um, especially since um, people have now started visiting the site to see the plover. Um, but I'd always encourage you to reach out to us and, and let us know what you think directly or, or flag us down when we're on site running out our transects and things like mm -hmm. that. Too. You mentioned larger scale impacts and that uh, led me to thinking more about dunes and the broader applications. It seems that they have great potential in our coastal environments. I'm wondering if there are other types of natural projects that would provide the same or um, similar level of protection from sea level rise. And I'm wondering if there are any examples that you're familiar with um, comparing different projects and what you might be learning from those as well. Yeah. 
So we've had a really uh, strong scientific advisory committee um, feeding us information leading into the development of this project. This project is probably the most cost-effective version of um, natural habitat restoration that uh, has been undertaken that we know of, but we've compared it to some of our similar projects from some of our partners up in Santa Barbara and Ventura County. Um, one particular example I'm thinking of is Surfers Point in Ventura, where they paired a dune restoration similar to this um, with a managed retreat, so moving park a series of parking lots um, back behind PCH. Uh, so I think there are opportunities to um, compare this. Another project is in San Diego, actually, where they're, they have a hybrid approach where there's um, a riprap kind of hard core of dune, and then on top of it is sand dunes. Um, so that would be a more intensive kind of hybrid approach of both hard and soft protection. So what we're doing is having these conversations with scientists and planners and managers up and down the coast of Southern California and putting this project in the context of evaluating it with a lot of other ideas and programs and projects. And what we're finding is that um, this type of approach is very cost effective. Great. It's uh, remarkable that we started this evening talking about global climate change, sea level rise, coastal storm impacts. We've talked about, you know, mega regulatory bodies in the Coastal Commission, and now we're focusing here on local solutions. Um, it seems like, Juliet, I wanted to circle back to you. Um, it seems like this pilot project gives us a head start on implementation of our adaptive management program. Um, that said, it seems like there is ob obviously a lot more to be done um, as environmental change begins to occur here in our local ecosystem. Um, Melissa talked about the tiered policies that are triggered by measured sea level rise increases. And I was wondering if you could help us understand what those triggers are, um, how we might monitor that situation, um, how, we would do, how we would go about doing so, and interestingly, how much of this is available for members of the public to view online? Yeah, so um, in this that you got, they, the, all the different um, triggers are listed here. And so I pulled them Sorry. out. No, it's okay. I pulled them out into some slides. But before we go there, the reason that we're thinking about a trigger-based approach is that, as we talked about with the modeling, we're doing our best with the modeling, right? And part of the thing that happens is that you have these projections that are done at the global scale. And so you guys may have or not have heard of these, these RCP. I don't know if you're following a lot of the climate change conversation. There's different projections. There's the business as usual. There's the Paris Accord. I'm sure most people have heard of the Paris Accord, right? So the goal with the Paris Accord is to get our greenhouse gas emissions to basically be um, enough that we get to just two degrees of warming. This red line is, unfortunately, this black line here is showing us where we are with our emissions and our temperature at this point. Unfortunately, we're tracking on this business as usual. This is the way that we are looking at what's happening in the atmosphere with carbon emissions and the earth warming. How this then relates to sea level rise is then we base these projections of, like, of sea level rise um, on what happens in the atmosphere. So here's your Paris Accord. Here is the business as usual. These are measurements from satellites of the, what the sea level is doing globally. And you see it tracking, again, unfortunately, on these higher levels. So a lot of when we're talking about the uncertainty and what the future holds, it has to do with the ice, as I talked about before, but it has a lot to do with what we globally <laughs> do with, the, with respect to what we put into the atmosphere. So, we don't know what that's going to hold. So we have to plan for the whole scenario because unfortunately we can't do that. We don't, we're not able to see into the future. So the city has outlined a series of ways to look at different triggers along the coast to say, when this happens, we're going to do this. Because we can't predict exactly when it's going to happen. We know the sea is rising, the coasts are eroding, all these things, these bad news things that I talked about before, they're happening. We don't know the exact rate at what they're happening. So as a city is trying to think about investing in what they need to do forward, this is one way where you can actually look at observable data and base your next action on what you're observing. 
the science and the modeling gives you sort of a path, but then you can go out and actually measure things to then say, okay, now's when we're gonna start doing X, Y, or Z. So all of that is what's outlined in here. And so really simply put, the four big ones are looking at what, the, when you go out, there's a tie gauge out there that measures sea height, looking at that, and once it gets to a certain threshold, then it triggers a bunch of actions. Looking at beach widths, so measuring just how wide the beach is annually to see how it's reducing, that will trigger another set of actions. Looking at when there's storms and impacts, you know, what is gonna happen, so if a building has 30% of its damage um, during a storm event, or it's seeing, um, I think it's like six hours of tidal flooding, for three years in a row, that's gonna trigger a set of actions. All of these, these are ways of taking the kind of esoteric science and making it observable and then making actions based off of it. So a lot of this we can actually already do. NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, they're the ones that, I don't know if they, they I don't know if they take care of the buoy out there, I'm not sure who manages that buoy, but they're the ones that read the measurements off of it. They already have this one, so you're done. You're, you can check tide gauge monitoring. That's one of the things that the city is able to do that information is available. Beach width is something that's really fun to do and I'm looking at Nick Sadgerpour from USCC grant back there because for months we've been talking with USGS. We go out and do this kind of mon um, monitoring where you get to strap on a backpack and walk on the beach all day. It's like a pretty good gig <laughs> and so Nick wants to do that and so <laughs> we're trying to figure out with USCC grant how we can get that going and help support the city in these monitorings that they want to do to be able to know when to take action. Um, but this is where you know maybe the people in the room can also come into this because we can also just take pictures. And what we established when we were, I was at USCC Grant and now with USGS, we're still partnering with them, is um, we've basically set up a protocol that you can go out to the beach any day, really. It doesn't have to be on these really high tide days, but you can go, we tell you, you stand at the water's edge, take a one landward step that way and shoot down the water that way and there's an app where you can load it and then it comes back to our team at USGS and we're able to take points and then compare that to what our model is projecting and ultimately that information can also feed into um, storm damage. You could be using the same app to look at storm damage and see what's happening um, for scour along the pier. So there's, there's lots of monitoring that can be done. Um, some cases, you know, for like the pier scour, you're probably gonna wanna have a trained coastal engineer who knows how to take the right measurements. But for a lot of this, this is something that uh, the interested public, if they so desire to walk on the beach, they can provide really good information that then will help the city be able to monitor and be ready to hit these triggers as they approach. Hopefully not too quickly. Hopefully we're on the blue line, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> so that's, um, I think that's, I think that's all I was gonna say, yeah, about that. Great. Um, before we go to audience questions, Melissa, I had one more question for you. Um, I was wondering um, how city residents or visitors, you know, they might, they might wonder, how will these policies directly affect me? Can you speak a little bit about some of the elements that are particularly relevant now that we know that a significant portion of um, our audience are residents? Yes. So the land use plan will provide the standard of review for development within the city's coastal zone. And as a resident or property owner in the city inland of PCH, most of these policies most likely won't impact how you develop your property. However, if you own a home or a business, again, inland of the PCH in a mapped coastal hazard area. So in, in this flyer, there is coastal hazard maps for a couple different hazards. And you can look to see if your property or your business falls in one of those. This is just the um, coastal storm flooding in a 100-year storm. So this is like the long-term extreme scenario that we're looking at. So if your home or your business is in one of these mapped coastal hazard areas, or if your property has been demonstrated to be in a hazardous location, then the way you are able to develop or redevelop your parcel is going to be affected by some of these policies. If your, par if your parcel is mapped in here, then for example, one thing you may have to do is give a technical hazards analysis that's submitted while you are doing your coastal development um, permit application. And that needs to show that the proposed construction will be stable and ex uh, for the expected lifespan of your development. After you apply for your coastal development permit, depending on what your technical analysis shows, 
Your project may need to be set back, recited, or redesigned depending on the susceptibility of the hazards. So if you're specifically looking at flooding, then you, need to, you may need to reaccommodate depending on your flooding. The city will also be able to put conditions on your permit that may require things such as monitoring, um, future relocation or removal of your structure when it becomes un unstable or unable to be occupied due to hazards. So the city's sea level rise policies ultimately aim to protect residents and visitors' recreational experiences in the city by a commitment to maintaining the city's coastal amenities, such as these beaches or these um, beach pathways, and by discouraging the use of shoreline protective devices, um, then we're ultimately trying to help save the beach and not negatively impact our beach width. Overall, the city's main priority is to prioritize these soft adaptation structures, like the ones that Karina was discussing, these beach nourishment, living shorelines, dune restoration projects, rather than these hard structures such as seawalls and groins, in order to maintain the city's beaches. Great, thank you. Uh, before we uh, go on, I wanted to just remind everybody that Liz does have paper and pen <coughs> if anybody wants to write down a question. Um, I wanted to uh, thank you, Melissa, for, for that. Um, I really think that tonight really demonstrates the value of bringing together rigorous science, ecological literacy, proactive planning, and community action. And so I wanted to thank you each for sharing a little bit about the role that you've played in, in the process of developing this, um, this framework. Um, any que are there any questions? Go ahead. Yeah, why don't you just go ahead. I'll repeat your question so everyone can hear it. Yeah. So that project actually employs a really interesting technology where the walls of the stormwater retention tank are actually permeable so that as the um, outside groundwater is pushing in, historically, if that was a um, non-porous material, it would push up on the, um, on the retention tank and it would pop up and then float on the water underneath it. Um, what we've been able to do is to develop a single wall membrane that allows uh, that water to come into the tank to um, be collected and then it is also run through the multi-treatment, um, the multi-level treatment and allow it to be used with some of the other stormwater and urban runoff that goes through the whole system so that it's a lot, it is able to minimize and offset the pressure from groundwater and flooding. Uh, the, the level of salinity that comes from it, given the size of the membranes, is minimal and something that the SMURF, which is the final treatment facility for that, can handle. Did you have a question as well? Yes. Just, just a, a quick one. What are the north and south borders of this map? Because I'm assuming there's a lot of people from Venice here, too. So does this go down to Venice on the south, and where does it go on the north? I'm not sure what's covered here. Well, so for this map itself, I, I don't know the exact street. I think you can say the street names. However, the information is available, both border sets of information border. from border to border of Santa Monica. But then if you're interested in other areas, this whole, all of this information is available from Malibu all the way down to um, Palace. The, I think actually the whole thing, all the way down to Long Beach. Yeah. So you can overlay this information. And there's, um, so for Santa Monica, it's done for you. But if you are interested in looking at it, we can give you the links where you can go in and do it yourself on the viewer online. Okay, and just a, a quick thing with the, the shoreline of Santa Monica varies. For instance, I live in the south part of Santa Monica. I'm not quite to Venice, but it's flat there. If you come more toward downtown, you have bluffs. What difference does that make? A lot. I would right. think so. Yeah, because, <laughs> you know. really talked about the two areas. Yeah, you know, it, um, and we can, you know, as you want, or there's also, we have a viewer that has all of this, so you can put your address and, and see it. But yeah, I mean, the water, 
So you hear about sea level rise as like, it's going to be 12 inches. But what you don't then talk about is if that's going up against a berm like this, that it stops, right? But if it's the flat area, then it's going to keep going. So it does matter. Um, we were showing just, I just showed one part of it. But you, um, if you are interested later, I can show you further south. Yeah. yeah. Yes. So there, there's a lot in that. Um, I think one of the things that's really interesting um, is that sometimes our um, our perception and our measurement tools come up with are are, um, are inconsistent with each other. So one of the things that we've seen in Santa Monica is that the city is recognized as a global leader in greenhouse gas emissions reduction. So the city has actually reduced its greenhouse gas emissions by more than 15 percent below 1990 levels, which was an aggressive target uh, to begin with. And so it, while there are elements of development that may not um, fit with the your, your, your sort of your your framework of a sustainable city and um, when we look at greenhouse gas greenhouse gas emissions particularly greenhouse gas emissions from um, existing buildings we do see a significant reduction in Santa Monica some of the other things that you're seeing happening here with new buildings um, new buildings are required to have mandatory solar uh, we were one of the first cities to develop a zero net energy requirement. We have our new water neutrality requirement. So we are really looking at opportunities to ratchet down on um, development as an opportunity to eke out the, some of the most significant environmental performance that you see anywhere in the region and anywhere in the state. And we're also going to start to see some really new and innovative approaches to greenhouse gas emissions reduction. So one of those you might be familiar with is our, um, is our Big Blue Bus. So right now our Big Blue Bus runs primarily on natural gas. Um, that natural gas has historically come from, um, it has been traditional natural gas. Natural gas has a lower greenhouse gas emissions profile than some of our historical fuels. But if you're familiar with hydraulic fracturing or other techniques for getting uh, natural gas um, to, to vehicles and to homes, um, they can be incredibly um, detrimental to human and environmental health. So the city was able to procure landfill natural gas for our big blue bus vehicles. So now all of our natural gas buses run on uh, clean, green, landfill-derived uh, natural gas. So we are no longer hydraulically fracturing, um, and, and we are reducing the methane that would have traditionally been associated with the decomposition of these materials in a landfill. Um, the other place that you're seeing that is you're going to start to see that in our municipal fleet. Um, you also start to see things coming out relative to our um, climate action and adaptation plan. So when the city was able to successfully reduce its greenhouse gas emissions 15% below um, 
1990 levels by 2015. Council then directed staff to develop a carbon neutral city plan. So staff will be coming back to the city council in the early fall with a plan to reduce greenhouse gas emissions 80% below 1990 levels by 2030, and then to achieve carbon neutrality by 2050 or sooner. So I think you will start to see a lot of effort in that area. Wow. Other questions? Yes. OPCs, not so that's different. That's OPCs um, sea level rise guidance that was adopted last night. Okay. Um, we don't know when or if this uh, California Coastal Commission is going to incorporate that into their personal sea level rise guidance. Okay. Um, but in terms of these specific policies, it does need to go to the Coastal Commission in order for it to be adopted. And then once it's adopted, um, the city's LCP is certified. And what that means is that the city is the one that is taking in coastal development permits and approving them. Right. So, okay, so this has to be approved. These policies, okay. yes. So, uh, you mentioned a couple of other things that I have a question mm -hmm. about. You mentioned something about um, uh, property transfer rights opportunities mm -hmm. and um, rate fees. And I'm wondering if any of that has been kind of flushed out in this. No, so this, um, those adaptive man. Yeah, um, she was asking if the co transfer, development transfer, and what was the other one you were interested in? Uh, rate fees. Rate fees were um, detailed in this, and so now Melissa's mm -hmm. going to answer. So, in the um, potential adaptive management programs, um, they're basically just like things that the city is going to be looking to potentially do in the future. So they're exploring all of those different ideas right now. Um, so none of them are like set in stone and those are going to be like necessarily adopted ones. But the language in here that you'll see is that these are the potential adaptive management strategies that we're developing. Um, and the benefit of something being an adaptive management policy is that it remains flexible so that as we do get more data and more monitoring done, we can like morph it and see what fits specifically to Santa Monica. All right, I really wanted to thank everyone. I know that you have actually now given us uh, a little bit of extra time. Uh, before we go, there's a couple things that I wanted to remind you. Um, one, I wanted to let you know that um, there are, there's seaweed, saltwater taffy and goldfish available for you. I'll let you see if you can pull out the frame in that. Um, I also wanted to thank everyone. I think it's really important in a city like Santa Monica that has led on these issues for many years, but is really looking to lead in the future to have a robust conversation about these things and um, to have a really, um, a, a, be willing to host a conversation about rigor science and um, really thinking about how it impacts our community moving forward. So thank you to each of our panelists. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you, Karina. Thank you, Juliet. And thank you, Shannon, for moderating. I really appreciate it. And I just, I just want um, to say I think it's been a really great partnership between si the city planning, between planning and community development, and the Office of Sustainability and the Environment that working on the projects that uh, Shannon talked about, that they're working on, working on the LCP together. And I think 
all together is what you know brings that approach that the city of Santa Monica is trying to take towards being very progressive about addressing things like sea level rise. Um, that's really what's making it work. So thanks again. Thank you all for coming. I really appreciate you being on our panel today. And thank you for um, being with us this evening.